Texas Mass Mundo audience, are we in store for a spectacular treat today? In the house, we have Juan Meza, PhD, uh, professor of applied mathematics at the University of California Merced, former director of the Mathematical Science Division of the National Science Foundation, a former Milby High School Buffalo from Houston's East End, a proud son of the Houston. East End, and a wonderful example for our youth. PhD, Dr. Juan Meza, right ahead with a fascinating perspective. Let me take a quick moment and ask if you like this sort of uh, content, that you please hit the subscription button and the notification bell, that you smash that like button, and that you make a comment below. It helps you with the, uh, with the YouTube algorithm. Let's spread this content, let's spread this beauty, let's spread this joy to as many people as possible. Juan Meza, Ph.D., University of California Merced, and a proud Milby Buffalo. Right ahead. My name is Saul Cantu, and this is Texas Math Mundo. Texas Math Mundo audience, are we in store for an extraordinary treat today? We have Mr. Juan Meza, PhD, Professor of Applied Mathematics at the University of California, Merced. He is the former Division Director of Mathematical Sciences for the National Science Foundation. Also, Dr. Meza earned his PhD at Rice University is a graduate of Milby High School, a proud Buffalo and son of Houston, Houston's East End. A true listing of all his accomplishments would be way too long, but I have a few highlights right here I want to share. 
as the dean. He served as the primary executive officer for the School of Natural Sciences and was responsible for establishing a vision and strategy for the school. Dr. Meza holds a position as professor of applied mathematics where his current research interests include nonlinear optimization with an emphasis on methods for parallel computing. Prior to jo joining UC Merced, Dr. Meza served as department head and senior scientist for high performance computing research at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where he led research programs in computational and data sciences. He held the position of distinguished member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories and served as the manager of the Computational Sciences and Mathematics Research Department before jo joining Berkeley Lab. Dr. Meza received the 2013 Rice University Outstanding Engineering Alumni Award and was named to Hispanic Business Magazine's Top 100 Influentials in the Area of Science. Dr. Meza has served on numerous external boards and federal advisory committees, including the National Research Council Board on Mathematical Sciences and their applications, the DOE's Advanced Scientific Computing Advisory Committee, the Boards of Trustee for the Institute of Pure and Applied Mathematics and SIAM, and the Board of Governors for the Institute for Mathematics and its applications. And that's me trying to keep it short, Dr. Mesa. That's me trying to keep it short, man. Uh, I'm so happy to have you here. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time from Houston's East End. Dr. Mesa, welcome. Thank you, Saul. It's a pleasure being here. Hey, I'm so happy you're here, man. Uh, let's start off by me just asking, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's been a wonderful summer so far. Awesome, awesome. You keeping busy? I am so busy. I can't even tell you, but you know, keeping busy is keeping me happy too. <laughs> Awesome, awesome, awesome. Before we get deep into that stuff, I want to do ask, you know, I'm sure work takes a lion's share of your time, but how do you have fun? What are your hobbies and interests? Oh, great. That's a that's a great first question. Well, I have to say my first love is reading books. I'll read just about any type of genre, science fiction, history, uh, mysteries. I mean, if, if it's in book form, I will read it. Uh, I also used to run a lot, but, uh, you know, as I get older, so I'm doing more and more walks. And, you know, that that's good. That's okay. It helps on my knees. There's a nice little trail, a wooded trail near my house that I just love to take hikes on. It's very relaxing to take those. Uh, and just this year, I decided to get back into playing some chess, uh, something that I, I kind of realized as I was preparing for this, that I used to play a lot of in high school. I was a member of the chess club there at Milby High. Really? Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, you've reached great heights in your professional career, and uh, but let's go back to the beginning. I want to know, you know, where are you from, born and raised, and what's your cultural heritage? Sure, sure. Well, I was born in Houston, actually. Uh, my parents had moved there the year uh, before from Monterrey, Monterrey, Mexico, not, Mon Mon not Monterrey, California. California. <laughs> uh, and I was their first child. Uh, when I was six, uh, my parents uh, moved the family back to Mexico. Uh, and there I spent uh, see five years before moving back to the U.S. Uh, now, one time I got curious because we'd moved around so much. I decided to see how many schools I'd been at. Uh, so would you believe I turned out I had attended 11 different schools in three different cities and two countries before I graduated from Milby High. Now, as to cultural heritage, I guess uh, the best description is probably Mexican-American slash Tejano. <laughs> So, you know, tell me about growing up in Houston's East End and Milby High School. Sure. Uh, well, it was certainly a very interesting experience. Uh, now, I went to both Milby and, as you as you know already, but I also went to Deedy Middle School right down the street from you guys. Uh, our house wasn't too far from either school, so I remember walking to both, uh, something you'd never let your children do these days, uh, apparently. But I, we were used to just walking back and forth and just going all, you know, all over the place. Uh, now, I had a chance to drive by the East End some years ago. Uh, not too surprisingly, it's very different. Uh, it's grown quite a bit, uh, a lot more industry there. Uh, but I really enjoyed both schools a lot. I, I mean, we had some fantastic teachers. Uh, I hope we get into the ability to talk about them a little bit more. And I made a lot of good friends, some of whom I still uh, stay in touch with today. Yeah, certainly I want to talk about those teachers. You know, I was going to ask, um, 
Do you feel that your experience growing up on the East End, uh, did it prepare you to succeed at the next stage? You know, I, I think it did. Yes. In fact, I, I would say absolutely it did. Uh, probably more so than I could have imagined at the time. Uh, you know, as I as I already mentioned, I had some very good, very notable teachers at Milby that I have to say I, I owe a great de- you know debt of gratitude to them. Uh, you know, these names probably don't mean anything to anybody anymore, but I just want to shout out to them because I, I think they just helped me so much in my career. Uh, Mr. Johnson and Ms. Worland, uh, two of our math teachers there were just simply amazing. Uh, we also had some other incredible teachers. We had a Mr. Smith, who was psychology. Uh, let me think, Mr. Greenwood, who was a physics teacher, and Mrs. McNeil, who was our uh, high school uh, senior English teacher. And she really prepared us so well for, for classes in college. Uh, you know, they all cared deeply about the students, and it was just very, very good to see kind of how well I was prepared for that. Uh, let me just give you one quick example, if it's okay. I remember going to math competitions across the city because uh, I was a, a member of the uh, Mu Alpha Theta Club. I, I don't know if you still have it or not, but I was one of those members there, yeah. And uh, Ms. Worlin, one of the math teachers that I just mentioned, she would not only help us prepare, but she would get up early on the weekends, right? So can you imagine a high school teacher getting up early on a Saturday to drive down to the competitions with us? You know, uh, now, you know, when I, you know, kind of really preserve my weekends for, for downtime, I can just really appreciate how much she just helped us out. And not just, like I said, at the, in the, at the club level, but going out and just making sure she supported us on the weekends. That was just incredible. Awesome. You're painting such a wonderful picture of Milby High School in the East End. I love that. <laughs> I love that. And what a great shout out to those who made a difference in your life uh, growing up in the East End. That's awesome. That's very They awesome. did. Yeah. So where did you attend college and what degrees did you earn? Sure. So I went to Rice University, of course, it's still in Houston, Texas. Now, my original plan was to major in some sort of an engineering kind of a degree. I wasn't sure exactly which one. Uh, you know, I mentioned my mom and my dad, but uh, my mom had not gone to college. My dad hadn't even graduated from high school, so they didn't really have a lot of experience with that. So I was kind of like flying blind, as you say. Uh, but now, strange coincidence, I got a job as a summer intern at NASA, Johnson Spacecraft Center, right down the road from you guys, uh, right out of high school. So it was I graduated from high school, went set to a work as a summer intern at NASA. And there I picked up programming. They had me working on a project doing computer programming, which hard to believe now, but that was just becoming a big thing. People really didn't do computers back in that time. So I decided to do electrical engineering because that was the closest thing I could get to computer science. There were still no computer science majors at the time. So then I ended up getting a bachelor's and a master's in electrical engineering. Uh, and uh, that's, that's when I decided, well, I think I'll go to work now. And so I went out to California, worked at a Silicon Valley computer company. But you know what? I just wasn't happy with the work that they assigned me. I just didn't feel like it was uh, challenging enough. And so I decided to apply for a PhD program uh, back at Rice. But, but this time, I thought I would try something slightly different. And I tried uh, mathematical sciences at the time. It's now called computational math. Uh, and that resulted in my receiving two more degrees, a master's and a PhD in computational and applied mathematics. Really? Wow. Wow. And uh, did you have uh, anybody, do you want to do a shout out to any professors at the time that really, really impacted your, your growth and path? Dr. Richard Tapia. And I believe you interviewed him I just a couple of episodes back. So yes, I he was he was a great teacher. There were other ones as well who were just fantastic. I mean, again, the 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 level of support for students from all of the faculty there was was amazing as well. Great, great. And you know, uh, he did mention you and he was very <laughs> proud of you, just so you know. He was very proud. So awesome, awesome. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I, I like so now you're the professor. You're the doctor. You are, uh, you know, a, a shining beacon of light for us. I'm telling you, in the East End. So I'm so happy. Uh, can you describe your job as a professor? Uh, as a professor. Sure. Well, you know, I have to say the life of a professor I, is pretty nice, uh, at least from my perspective. Uh, I'm at the University of California system at the Merced campus, as you mentioned. It's the newest campus in the UC system. So a lot of people may not know about uh, the, the Merced campus, but it's the first American research university in the 21st century. At least that's how we like to build ourselves. Now, as a professor here, we have three main obligations. We have what's called research, we have teaching, and then we have service. Now, the first part, the research, 
Well, that's really very fulfilling. I mean, there's really, so I can't tell you what a great feeling it is when you're working on a problem, you're knocking your head up against a brick wall, working on something, and then bang, you get the answer. You figured out, you figured out what, 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 how, you know, how to solve the problem. Now, of course, hey, like my, my parents used to say, it's not over till it's over. And the part of it is you've got to write it up. You got to finish it up. You got to put it up for peer review. Your colleagues have to judge it and you have to get accepted for publication. So, I mean, there's still a lot of work involved with that. But I got to tell you, when you finish that, when you have that piece of paper in hand, well, okay, you used to have a piece of paper in hand. Nowadays, you have a, you have a link to a, to a website. Uh, but it's really hard to describe how good that feeling is. Of course, the teaching part of it is also fantastic. I get a chance to sit in front of classrooms and kind of, you know, ex tell uh, the students, you know, what kinds of things are out there that they could be doing as well with mathematics. And, uh, you know, that's also very, very rewarding as well. You know, I did look up your list of publications and it's an impressive list. And you just mentioned just how fulfilling it is to, uh, to actually uh, submit a publication and have it published. It is. It is. It's, it's indescribable, really. <laughs> awesome. 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 Uh, I do. Just recently, uh, you were the uh, director of mathematical science at the National Science Foundation. Can you describe your responsibilities there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the job of division director for mathematical sciences, it's, it's probably one of the best jobs I've ever had in my career. Uh, it it's basically entails overseeing the allocation of federal funds. You know, this is our U.S. government has federal funds and they choose to uh, give, give the money to the National Science Foundation and we then allocate it to uh, researchers across the country. Now, that's close to $250 million per year. So think about that, a quarter of a billion dollars going out to researchers across the entire country and math departments, statistics departments, everywhere in the U.S. Uh, and that includes research universities. It includes four-year colleges of all sorts, uh, community colleges as well. So it, it really, it, 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 it it's essentially entails any kind of uh, work going on in the mathematical or statistical sciences. We have a, a, a hand in that. Uh, and so what our division does is it takes proposals from the faculty we have them reviewed, and then we make recommendations on which ones to fund. Uh, and that's that's something that happens, you know, it's it's every single day of the year we're working on something. We get over 3,000 proposals a year that we have to manage. Uh, so there's a lot of hard decisions that need to be made at every single uh, step along the way. Now, the program managers at the National Science Foundation, I have to say, are some of the most hardworking, the most dedicated professional people I have ever come across. They know that they're basically entrusted with maintaining the highest level of research that we can so that the U.S. maintains its scientific leadership in the world. And they take their jobs very, very seriously. They're also very deeply committed to broadening participation, I will say. And so they're always looking to try to find different ways and means of making sure that the funds are allocated in a way that also broadens the participation of, of folks in the mathematical sciences. Awesome. What a job. What a responsibility. Holy cow. Wow. Oh, so I do want to ask about you because, you know, you're like I say, I can't, can't repeat this enough. You're a shining example for our youth, man. You're a shining example. I want to know who inspired you, shaped your value system uh, and your mentors and role models. Sure. Uh, well, I have to say, I'm, I've been very fortunate in my career. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how many folks have helped me out. I've had many mentors throughout my entire career, starting, starting you know, very, very early on. Uh, I had to, of course, got a, got a big shout out to my mom and my dad. I mean, they're, they're the first two. They really shaped me the most, and, and they really had a, a big say in sort of the way I think about things. Uh, you know, both in their own and in, in very different ways. Uh, my mother, uh, you know, I learned not to worry about things. Uh, you know, there's, there's an old saying that she used to say that your, your students may, may appreciate. Si, si hay remedio para que te apuras. Y si no hay remedio para que te apuras. So if, for those who don't speak Spanish, you know, if, if there's a remedy to the solution to the problem, then why are you worried? And if there isn't a remedy to the solution, then why are you worried? <laughs> so, so I learned that from her. Now, my father was really outstanding with numbers. So I think I inherited my ability to work uh, in math from him. Uh, you know, the, the, the only thing that I always feel sorry about is he wanted to be an engineer as well. But, you know, he came from a very large family in Mexico. Uh, so his first duty was to take care of his family. So he had to quit high school uh, at about the time that he would have been you know, getting ready to go to, to you know, higher uh, education. 
So he always regretted not being able to do that. And so in a way, I think I think I kind of, you know, fulfilled some of his uh, dreams as well. Uh, I've already mentioned some of the high school teachers that, that, that I, that I uh, in, at Milby. I mean, fantastic people, always ready to inspire students. At Rice, we already touched on the fact that uh, Richard Tapia was one of these folks who were just, uh, I think, once in a lifetime inspirational uh, people. Uh, you know, he is, his record, I mean, you think my record is, is good, but I mean, his record is amazing. And he's not only technically superb, but he's done so much for broadening participation in science, in mathematics. Uh, he really deserves a special place in this science hall of fame. If we, we need to put a science hall of fame together, but he, he'd be right up there as being one of those very special people in there. Very, very few people have been able to make contributions in both the science and the diversity. I mean, a lot of people do one or the other. He's combined it too in a way that is just unique. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Both of y'all just awesome. Uh, you know, and that brings me to the next point. You know, I did interview Dr. Tapia, and that was a great pleasure, as mm -hmm. I'm having right now with you. <laughs> According to Dr. Tapia, the numbers of underrepresented minorities, in particular black and brown, math faculty in our tier one universities is woeful. And he gave some numbers. How do we change that? Sure. Now, he's absolutely correct about that. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, yeah. When I graduated from Rice uh, uh, with my PhD in math, uh, I was uh, uh, in my office one day and Dr. Tapia came in and he said, hey, I just got some great news from the National Science Foundation. They said that there were six Hispanic Latinos in the country that year in PhDs. In the entire country, there were six. And I said, well, that doesn't sound like good news. <laughs> and he goes, three of them came from Rice and you're one of them. So I was one of three at Rice and one of six in the country that year that got a PhD in math. Right wow. now, I got curious and then uh, uh, I, I looked at the numbers right before uh, our a little uh, interview here. And uh, in 2018, that's the last year that we have numbers for, there were 59 PhDs awarded to Latinos and Latinas in 2018. F 59. That's up from 29 in 2008. So, you know, okay, it looks like we're making progress. Now, for context though, let me let me let me let me tell our audience what the, what that context is. The Latino population in the U.S. right, 62 million people right now. It accounts for 18 and a half percent, so almost 20 percent. One out of five Americans is Latino. At the same time, the percentage of Hispanic Latino PhDs is 4.7 percent. Wow. Right. So let's round it up. Five percent. Now here's the sad part about it. That number's been the same for about the last 30 years. Four to five percent are Latino PhDs, or even a little bit more of all PhDs. About four to five percent are Hispanic, right? So you can see the numbers have increased, you know, from six to twenty-nine to fifty-nine. But when you think of it in terms of percentages, right now I have to say our country is really woefully behind. So increasing the number of faculty in Tier One universities, you know, what we call R One, that's going to be hard. That's going to be hard. But there's a lot that we can be doing. So the first step I would say is I need to probably encourage all of your audience members, anybody in high school, we need more young people to consider graduate school, particularly in STEM fields because the numbers are so low there. Now, these are fields, I will tell you, that have really high potential for anybody, but even more so for underrepresented minorities because this is really about uh, upward economic mobility. This is, these are the jobs of the future. Many, many of the new jobs, the future jobs, are going to require some sort of an advanced degree. And if our country is going to maintain leadership, you know, I keep mentioning this leadership in science engineering, we've got to engage the entire, entire population, not just small segments of it. So now we also need to encourage universities to be more inclusive. Uh, there are many places and disciplines that I'm sorry to say are still not particularly inviting to URMs, underrepresented minorities, but I think it's important for, for the systems, the organizations, the universities to really take this problem very seriously and to do more to try to be more inclusive. Well said, well said. Uh, and you know, uh, images are everything. And that's why I have you on this program because what a shiny image. And you know, you, Dr. Tapia, you all are like um, right there at the front lines, man. So I really, really want to have uh, to present you to my audience. And especially, hopefully, you can light a fire under them. 
and really work hard. We're trying. We're trying. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so I did want to ask about um, your, did your Hispanic ethnicity impact your journey? Well, I think, I think the answer is absolutely. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think all of us are shaped by our culture, our ethnicity. ethnicity. Uh, I think that's one of our strengths, though. That's what makes diversity especially powerful. You know, in my case, it helps me to see problems in different ways. You know, when you're trying to solve a research problem, it really helps to think differently. And so you get to see solutions in places that others might not because of your worldview. It's, it's, it's a different, different cultural perspective. Uh, so, for example, uh, I tend to think in terms of teams. Why? Well, growing up, you know, we always did things as a family or in groups, right? Yeah. Individuality wasn't emphasized as much as it is in, in other places. And so while I'm working, I work in groups and, and that's really more of the norm. That's sort of the, what, what I experienced as a, as a kid growing up. So when I look for solutions, what do I do? Well, I tend to think of how to bring all of the team's talents together rather than say, okay, let's, let's see if we have one exceptional individual, let's task him with this or her with that. And, and be at that. No, let's bring the group together because for me, it's the strengths of all the people coming together that gives you something bigger than the sum of the parts. But here's the important part, though. Here's, and this is really important. Research, it's really about asking the right set of questions. Okay, there's a quote I like on this subject, which I, which I will share with you. It's by the co-founder of the TED Talks, which I, I think you're, you're familiar with and probably a your audience might be. Uh, his name is Richard Saul Worman. And he says, in school, we're rewarded for having the answer, not for asking a good question. Sure, getting the right answer is important, but the right solution to the wrong question doesn't advance science. What we really need to do is we need to first figure out what the right question is. And here, I believe, I strongly believe that having a different worldview, a different culture, a different ethnicity, that's what helps us in asking the right questions. You bring all of these different questions together. Now you get a chance to really pick out the best one. Man, I love that answer. I love that answer. How uh, <laughs> just a different cultural perspective can actually uh, advance your, uh, you know, um, advance uh, your ability to tackle problems just because you come from a different angle. Wow. Yeah. And that group, that group mentality, you know. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, I guess we already established there weren't many Hispanics along your path as you were traveling that path. Um, did you feel isolated in your experience? And did you have trouble with a sense of belonging? Yeah. So, so I mean, these are, oh boy, these are deep questions, Howell. These are, these, are, these are really good questions. So, so you're right. There weren't a lot of Hispanics along my path. Uh, especially early on. It's changed a little bit in the, in the last 10 years or so, but certainly when I first started off, there were not many, uh, especially in the technical workforce. Now, why do I make that distinction? Well, because early on in my career, a lot of organizations would just aggregate all the numbers together to show that they were very diverse. But then if you ask the question, how many people are on the technical side? How many people are on the management side? Well, then all of a sudden, you know, it was probably, you could count the numbers in one hand. Most of the diversity came from folks working in facilities or maintenance or, or things like that. All right. And that's nothing bad. I had a job as a, as a janitor when I was in high school. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I know that side of the house as well. But, but that's, that's what I mean about there, there wasn't diversity in, in, in that sense. So was I feeling isolated? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, you know, when you're one of two, three in, in a company, you know, the first job I was at, I was one of three, I think, Hispanics in the technical workforce out of a thousand people, wow. right? It, they, were just, they were just not many at all. Now, I'm a nerd, and I will probably call myself that. But, so it's a little easier in that respect, because when you get around technical folks, and you just talk the technical talk, and you, you geek out, and, and so it's not so isolating there. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, on the other side of it, it there's really, you don't have the support networks uh, that, that a lot of other folks have. I mean, they were essentially non-existence for, for any group, uh, any Latino group, any African-American group, Native American group, uh, even women at that time. You know, there were not a lot of support networks. So, you know, let me give you an example here again. Work meetings were always difficult for me. 
So early in my career, I'd just generally sit, I would listen, I wouldn't say a whole lot of things. During the non-work related portions of the meeting, you know, people were socialized and stuff like that. Well, people would talk about golf, skiing, scuba diving. Uh, you know, well, those aren't the kinds of things you grow up with uh, doing on the east end of, uh, of Houston, right? <laughs> uh, and so I didn't have a lot to discuss with them. I didn't bond with a lot of those people there. Uh, even the norms about who speaks up at a meeting, when they speak up, I mean, these were all foreign to me, right? Uh, you know, in the Latino culture, you know, you have this thing we call respect for elders, right? You never, ever, you know, uh, interrupt somebody. Or you never ever correct somebody if they're wrong. Uh, and yet the fact of the matter is that at a lot of meetings like this, that was the expectation and that was the norm. So it was difficult for me to figure out what these unwritten rules were. It took me a long time to figure this out. And the problem was is if you're not speaking up at a meeting, if you're not participating, if you're not socializing, uh, you're not viewed as a contributor. You're not given the good assignments. You're not given the promotions. Uh, so a lot of these things, they both isolate you and they keep you isolated. So until you learn these rules, it's very difficult to really contribute. Once I started to get the hang of this, once I started to figure out these things, then it became easier to move ahead. But it took a long time. It took me a lot longer than I think other people did. What a fascinating perspective, man. What a fascinating perspective. Wow. You've been, I think it speaks a lot to your personal strength to endure in these environments, to excel in these environments, and to reach the uh, professional heights that you've reached. I, and I think I get part of that from my mom and my dad. You know, my mom used to say that I was a little bit terco. Uh, and so uh, again, to translate for those who don't understand, it's a stubborn, uh, which I, I decided to call persistent instead. So we should be persistent. <laughs> Absolutely, well, it paid off. Persistence pays off, right? Yes. <laughs> so, you know, so you've reached such Fantastic heights. And I'm so humbled that you decided to come on my show. I do want to ask, so do you personally feel a sense of responsibility to give back? You're from the Houston East End. Uh, or have you leveraged your position uh, to uh, encourage underrepresented minorities to pursue STEM careers? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, I, I definitely I try to contribute back as much as I can. I certainly feel a personal responsibility. Uh, let me give you an analogy. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I received financial aid. That included several loans. So after I graduated, I paid off those loans. Now, at the same time, I, I recognized that I, I'd gotten a lot of help from people, people like Dr. Tapia, lots of other professors, uh, you know, even the high school teachers that I mentioned. And, and you know, what this amounted to was, you know, a lot of advice, mentoring, moral support. So like, like, like the student loans, I kind of thought a lot of these as loans as well. They, I think of them more as moral debts, right? They're moral debts that I need to repay back to those people. So, so I needed to pay them back and I needed to figure out how to do this. And so I've tried to do that throughout my career. I've tried to mentor folks. I've tried to uh, help out other folks who, who maybe found themselves in similar situations to where I was. Uh, and so I, I, I've done this uh, in, in a way that I hopefully paste back some of the, the folks that I that I owe these moral debts to. Now, there are two differences, I think, between between this and student loans. So the first is you don't need to pay back the loan, the debt to the person that gave it to you. In fact, when I help people out, I say, you don't need to pay me back. All right. You thank me. You know, thank me. That's fine. But you don't pay me back. Pay it forward. So pay it back to somebody else because that's how we keep the momentum going. This is how we how we increase our numbers and how we help each other out. The second difference is that unlike student loans, repaying these debts really brings me joy and happiness. I love helping out somebody. I love it when they I see them kind of go get that aha. Oh, that's why I'm not getting ahead. Oh, that's what happened in that job interview. Oh, this is this is how to get this uh, research done. That's, you know, that gives me joy, gives me happiness. And, and, and just when I see them advancing their careers and becoming leaders themselves, that to me is all, all the debt the, that, that I, I, the repayment that I need. So I'm now at a point in my career uh, where I think I can help out others. I really see my role as taking everything I've learned, the successes, but the failures too, those are important, distilling them down to the important lessons. What are the key lessons here? and then passing it along to others. That's really what I feel like like my role is now. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, so 
So what are the obstacles that today's underrepresented minorities face as they're trying to uh, pursue STEM careers? Sure. Okay. I, I mean, this could take an entire hour, right? There's oh. so many obstacles right now. Uh, and I'm sure people will have a lot of different perspectives. But let me give you what one, the one that I think is one of, one of the biggest obstacles. And that is that we, and I mean people, underrepresented groups in, in all of us, don't have enough robust networks in place to help each other out, right? A lot of us are first generation. Uh, a lot of us haven't been in these a lot of these places and uh, research universities, research organizations. We, we don't know what, what to do. Uh, so, so many times I see talented students come in, say, to UC Merced or, or to uh, say summer internships when I used to work at the labs, and they give up because they just don't understand how the systems work. So, let me give you another analogy, okay? I'm, I, I'm, I'm full of stories today for some reason. Uh, I like to watch both basketball and soccer. So, you know, I've been watching the, the, the Golden State Warriors. Hey, go, go, go Golden State. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, uh, but I also like soccer from when, I was, from when I was a kid. Now, if you didn't know much about either one, on the surface, they might look similar, right? Okay. They're both team uh, sports. They're played on a rectangular field. They both use a ball, roughly the same size. And the main idea, the main goal, if you will, is to put the ball through an opening that has a net. All right. Now, suppose you're good at one sport or the other. Uh, let's say soccer. Let's say you're really good at soccer. And now you find yourself in a basketball court and you're told, go ahead and join that team over there. How well do you think you'd do? Not well. Right? It wouldn't matter how much talent you had. The rules and the culture are different. That's what happens when we take really highly talented high school students and you put them in a big research university, right? The rules, but more importantly, the culture is different. The expectations are different. And this happens all along the way, from college, through job interviews, to career advancements and promotions. Now, some people, They've been raised in a family where a lot of these roles are second nature. And if not, then they have other social infrastructures where they've absorbed some of these roles. But for a lot of first generation students, see, I was a first generation student. That's not the case. So in spite of all your potential and all your talent you may have, you struggle because you don't know the rules. And until you've learned those rules, you're going you're gonna to struggle. So we need to build these networks to support each other. Right. It's in place of our tios and abuelitos and abuelitas who would tell us these, all of these things ahead of time. No, we need to build these networks so that we can learn from each other and to help each other advance our careers. Now, I always get a smile when I hear people say, you know, I'm a self-made man or I'm a self-made woman. Well, you know, every one of us got to where we were because of help from others. I'm proud to say that I've had a lot of help. But, you know, it took a lot of people to get me to where I am today. So whether you choose to acknowledge them or not, you know, everybody has had a lot of help. Hey, man, what a great analogy. What a great description some, from someone who's been there and been through it. Man, you've been there. You've been through it. And I love it, man. What a great insight. That's <laughs> wonderful insight. Thank you for that description. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> so from your perspective position, what is the outlook for underrepresented minorities in STEM careers? I'm an optimist. So <laughs> it's getting better, slowly, but it, it is getting better. The main problem really is that the world, as I see it, is changing. And that rate of change is really accelerating. Universities, um, they're adapting, they're evolving, uh, but it, they, will they be able to change quickly enough to survive this brave new world? And yes, by the way, that's a nod to one of my high school English teachers, Brave New World. <laughs> but what's also important is that we need to retain the best of what universities can provide us while we continue to adapt, right? Uh, universities are still a great place to explore new ideas. Uh, they have open discourse and to experience just the joy of discovery of, of something new. I'm hopeful but to be honest, I think it's going to take time and, and I think it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of persistence on all of our parts to, to get us, get us, keep us moving. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, 
do you ever come back to the East End, or is that in your distant past? Um, unfortunately, I haven't really been back to the East End in a long time. Uh, you know, like I said, I drove by there a while ago. Uh, it uh, it was a very different place, but I really don't have a lot of uh, friends in that area anymore. Uh, my family's all moved away from that. They're still in Houston. Some of them are in Houston, but they're out in different parts of Houston as, as it expanded. So I haven't had much of a chance to really get out there and, and uh, uh, visit very much. And not a lot of opportunities. Yeah, yeah. So I do want to ask, you know, um, what advice can you give any of our youth, uh, perhaps a younger version of yourself that may, that may come across this interview? I, I know you give a talk on interview skills. You want to share some insights? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, well, this talk, it's, a, it's an interview talk about, well, it's a talk about the un, what I call the unwritten rules of interviewing. Uh, so let me give you the backstory from that. Okay, so the talk grew out of some observations. And so what happened was is I was a hiring manager for uh, several uh, national labs. So uh, Sandia National Labs and Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, and what I noticed was is that a lot of candidates would come in. Uh, and, and the ones from underrepresented uh, backgrounds or women, uh, when they came in, uh, they thought they had done a fantastic job at the interview. They were like, wow, I really nailed it. I did a good job at that. And the reality was is on the other side of the table, everybody was kind of going, nah, that, that person's just not going to cut it. They just they don't make the top list. And so they would never get job offers. Now, I was in the uncomfortable situation of I was a hiring manager a lot of times. I had to call them back up and say, sorry, we're not going to be making you a job offer. And the more I did that, the more I got this, but I interviewed so well. And, and my, my thought was, well, actually, you didn't. And, and what happened was is there were these unwritten rules that, that I keep mentioning, and they didn't know them, and they were violating them kind of left and right. And so what would happen was is they got a different impression than we did from the other side of the table. And I said, you know, we need to lift this curtain. We need to, you know, move it aside and say, okay, here's what's really happening. So I gave a talk at one of the uh, workshops actually at Rice University. Richard Tapia invited me, and I and I gave this 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 talk where essentially I said, here's what you said at the interview, and here's what we heard, and it was like oh, and so all of a sudden these light bulbs would go off in terms of oh yeah okay I I understand now. So, so that's where the genesis of that of that talk was. And so, what what, what are some things? What are some examples? Well, uh, the key point is that most students, most people, when they go in, didn't prepare enough for their interviews. They just did not understand. Look, it's up to you to really make the case for why you should have this job. And so, clear example, you know, uh, what? I'll give you an example from, from the talk. Uh, why do you want this job, so? And you might start saying, well, you know, I think I could learn this. This would help my career. Uh, this would be very good for, for my next job. Okay, yeah, yeah, but what about the employer? What are you doing for them, right? And so what they what we heard was, is, well, this is all about you, and I'm sorry, but this job is about us. So that was a very clear one, but most most people didn't really quite get that, that part. Um, another one is that you really need to take charge from the beginning and, and analyze this as if you're going into a final exam or something like that. You need to prepare for these for these kinds of interviews. Uh, and the last one was, uh, I, which I always gave, and I always got some very interesting looks from the audience, was this, you know, at the end of almost every interview, you're given an opportunity to ask questions. It is so, so important to have one or two or three questions ready to ask. A lot of people would come up and they would say, well, no, I already asked that question at the last session, so I'm not, I don't have any questions for you. And it was like, uh, wouldn't, you read, wouldn't you like to have a different perspective or don't you think, you know, I might be able to add on to that? But I mean, a lot of the people would have no questions whatsoever. And so again, one of these things where it was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so these kinds of things, you know, everybody knew about them and were all discussed on the other side of the table, but very few people knew about them when they were interviewing. So these were the kinds of things I just wanted to, like I said, I wanted to, you know, move the curtain and see, okay, let's see what's behind that curtain. 
what practical, great, magnificent insight. You know what I'm saying? Something very <laughs> tangible the kids who watch this can take away with can take away with them. Well, I hope I hope so. And by the way, that talk and I've given it several times uh, is on the on my website. So they're you know they can get much many more details about about what the the talk is about. I'll post it in the video description below. All right. I'll post that website address. Awesome. All right. Great. Any other pieces of advice you want to give? Uh, let's see. Any other any final thoughts on on, on advice or something like that? Uh, well, I'm going to do that, but before oh. that, I do want to ask you. You know, uh, what does the future hold for you, Doctor Meza? What does the future hold for you? <laughs> sure, great question. Uh, for now, I'm taking a short break. Uh, the the four years at NSF were fantastic, uh, but it was it was a. Uh, uh, Definitely a full-time job, and it, uh, it, it took a lot of energy. Uh, right now, I'm scheduled to teach a course in the fall. Uh, I'm very excited about this class. It's a totally new class. It will be a freshman seminar, uh, and it's going to be titled, I'm going to title it, How Math Will Save the World. Really? Right, uh, yes. And so it's based on a set of lectures, which I gave um, almost uh, oof, uh, eight or nine years ago. And I gave several of these. And, and the idea was is that the mathematics that you s learn about is very different than the one that you actually use in real life or in real world problems. And people are sometimes not aware of some of the things that mathematics is doing behind the scenes. So what I did is I put together a talk that essentially said, here's one of the great challenges of our lifetime. It's climate change. Right. And you think of it as maybe a physics or a chemistry kind of a problem. But really, a lot of what we understand about climate change, a lot about what we predict about climate change, a lot about how we it, intend to address climate change, there's a mathematical foundation behind it. But once again, you know, it's veiled behind this curtain of, of lots of equations and stuff like that. So what I wanted to do was to make sure that the students understood that Okay, you may not want to be a mathematician, but it is very important to you to be able to understand that it's the foundational aspects of all of this is mathematics. So I've since expanded it to climate change and now the pandemic. You know, we've just gone through two years of this. We now have a vaccine that was put together in record time. Well, there's a lot of mathematics that went into modeling how the epidemic was going to evolve and how we were going to then... Uh, curtail it based on different kinds of policies. There's mathematics behind all of that that people are totally unaware of. So what I wanted to do was really go and make a case for why mathematics will help save the world. And hopefully it will help answer that age old question that all students have when they learn some concept in math. When am I ever gonna use that? <laughs> Maybe some of your students <laughs> even have, have asked those kinds of questions. So. <laughs> Man, I want to sit in that class. Man, I can't tell you how lucky a kid's going to be to walk into that class next year. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. I'm, I'm excited, like I said. I'm, I'm very excited about that class. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Now, do you have any parting words or final thoughts as we conclude this interview? Sure. Well, first of all, let me just thank you. It's been a real pleasure, Saul. I've just thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Uh, it's, it's just been a, 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 I'm having a great time. Uh, final bits of advice or, or words of wisdom. Um, well, I, I, I really want to encourage all, all students, uh, actually everybody, I mean, be a lifelong learner. I mean, we sometimes tend to think of, of high school or college as being, okay, you go through this and, and, and now you're done. Uh, it's so important these days to be a lifelong learner because, you know, uh, you know, there's lots of studies out there that say, you know, you're going to be switching jobs every five years, or you're going to be switching positions or, or what you do every, every, you know, five, four, three years sometimes. And so learning how to learn is very important. And so this is something that I think everyone should, should kind of keep in mind. Uh, read as much as you can and, and, and hopefully read outside your comfort zone. Uh, I think right now, a lot of us are trying to just kind of be, you know, if we read, we just stick to one particular type of reading, but try to read something outside your comfort zone, because that'll help you expand and grow in, in many different ways. Um, I would also tell students, ask for help when you need it, and then pay it forward when you have the chance. As I mentioned before, I think the important part is we need to help each other out. We're stronger together 
that individually, and I think this is something that I, that all of us need to do, but especially younger students, I think a lot of times don't ask for help when they really need it. Uh, and so I always tell my students, you know, you've got to learn to ask for help. It's not a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of strength to realize that, hey, I don't know this, but I, I know somebody who can help me. And then the final thing is, if you have a choice between being right and being kind, be kind. It's always better to be kind. Wow, Dr. Mazin, that's incredible advice, man. That's great. That's great. You know, I will say, you know, I've taught in the East End for 23 years now, and uh, images are powerful. And I think sometimes these kids need someone they can identify with and whose image, you know, that becomes part of their self-image, you know. So, so you're precisely the image I want to present to them. You know where I'm coming from? You're from the East End. You've got done there. You've done that. And uh, I think it's just you provide such an incredibly powerful image for these kids. And I can't even begin to tell you how much pleasure I'm deriving from being able to present this to them. So oh, I thank you so much. Thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and let me just also add that, you know, as a high school teacher, you are the first step in a very long set of steps that are going to happen. So your role in this is, is also incredible. I mean, this is, this is without you, there wouldn't be anybody at the college level or at the graduate school level. So, so really we're indebted to you for making sure that those students get that first step and they're going in the right direction. So thank you for all the work that you do. Hey, Dr. Mays, I appreciate those words. I really do appreciate those. And let me, let me add this. You, uh, if you ever end up in Houston, I know you got some family you sit around. I hope you know, I'm a friend. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Do you remember how good the taquerias are around here? Oh, my goodness, yes. <laughs> Let's go visit one of these taquerias one day. If you're ever in the Houston area, you know, hit me up. Let's go have some good, good food out here in the, in the wonderful taquerias in the East End. And I think that would be so enjoyable. That would be wonderful. I would love that. <laughs> Thanks hey, for the invitation. I appreciate it all, Dr. Meza. Thank you very much. I wish you the very best and, and farewell. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, So Bye-bye. Wow, what a fascinating discussion. What incredible insights by Juan Meza, PhD, uh, University of California said. He, there was a lot to take away from that. It was pure joy. I really enjoyed the discussion. And he, sh he shared a lot, a lot of wisdom from a guy who's been there and done that. Thank you very much, Dr. Meza. I really appreciate it. Uh, let me take a moment and ask that if you uh, enjoy this content, that you please hit the subscription button and the notification bell, that you smash that like button, and that you make a comment below. It helps me out with the YouTube algorithm. Let's spread this joy. Let's spread this beauty to as many people as possible. Uh, I have plenty of wonderful things in store for this channel, and I truly appreciate your support. My name is Saul Cantu, and this is Texas. Math.